Hello and welcome to the Managing Uncertainty Podcast. I'm Brian Strauser, Principal and Chief Executive here at Bright Path, and this is episode 250. So we have a pretty good uh, chunk of the team with us, Bray, Haley, Jamie, and I, and we're going to go through a conversation for our 250th episode. Um, so we'll do quick introductions and then we'll get into some discussion. So let's start with Bray. Hey, everybody. Uh Bray Wheeler, Senior Consultant here at Bright Path. And Bray, how long have you been here at Bright Path now? Ooh, that's a great question. Um, so long I've lost count. Um, I think we're at six years, Okay, almost seven, somewhere okay. there. Haley? Hi, my name is Haley Olvey. I'm a Senior Analyst and I have been at Bright Path a little over a year now. And Jamie Anderson. Hello, I'm Jamie Anderson. I'm also a senior consultant at Bright Path, and I joined about the same time as Haley just over a year ago. Awesome. So the podcast, we did the, I did the first, I say I, cause it was just me at the time. I did the first episode in, I think this November or December, 2016, um, with a portable mic at the Airbnb I was renting in Phoenix because we had a major project in Phoenix and I was there about every other week. And I remember this particular Airbnb was like a hacienda behind the owner's house. Uh, it had access only from the alley. And there weren't actually, there wasn't actually like a table in this place. There was like a couch and like a chair hanging from the ceiling kind of thing you could swing on. And then there were some stools at the bar. And I remember sitting at the bar by, in the kitchen uh, recording the first episode. Uh, and then things have just kind of gone from there. And I know we the podcast had a few hiatuses here and there, um, like during COVID initially, as we were just swamped with other things. But that was eight years ago. And now at 250 episodes, what what's, what's really changed with business continuity and crisis management since that time? What's different today than it was eight years ago? Well, I think certainly from COVID was a big game changer in, in terms of how people are thinking about this space in general. I think before, you know, the way that we talk about it, it's people, workplace, technology, third parties, you know, et cetera, but really kind of those four categories that was the four kind of areas we really went in depth with on you know different clients and in conversations and the way that we thought about it mm -hmm. post covid it's kind of weird having some of those same conversations or alluding to you know okay well now we know what to do when everybody has to work from home so how are we modifying things differently or what spaces are we just not talking about as much or facilities being one you know there's a lot less facility dependence and a lot more technology dependence. Well, I remember an it's I, I remember an issue that a couple of people on this here in this recording dealt with when we were working together at our previous employer a decade or so ago, where we lost a number of floors in a building due to a uh, flood, uh, and the flood was uh, a one-inch water line that uh, leaked over a weekend, and we set up even then. Uh, with less capable technology, that was 12 or 13 years ago, we set up alternate workspace, which was a huge freaking deal for yeah. these teams. And one person showed up. Uh, and today, if you told people they had to work from an alternate site, they would just go home with their laptops if they even were coming to the office to begin with. We had another client, too, that a lot of their continuity focus was set up around having a vendor that was providing them alternative workspace and alternative technology space. And, you know, and another client that was using, tr you know, they had reserved tons of trailers to go trailers. parking yeah. to go do stuff. So, I mean, that's two clients there that had a lot of thought and energy put into alternative workspaces that COVID just sort of turned on its head and said, you don't need any of that. Just send people home. As long as you got internet, send them home. I think that Jimmy, oh, was like, Jimmy, you've been at this a long time. What do you, what do you think? 
Yeah, I think COVID really spurred that a lot of technical advancements too in supporting that remote workforce and the cloud computing and the things we've seen come since then. I think another thing I've noticed since 2016 is the focus on enterprise resilience um, over just business continuity or crisis communications or disaster recovery, really that focus on a holistic enterprise resilience strategy that touches all the bases and, and those areas working much more closely together. Yeah, it doesn't seem deprioritized like it did, you know, in 20, you know, we're using 2016 as a marker. 2016, you know, a lot of this stuff was just sort of, okay, we either have to do it or we're big enough that we should do it or we're having enough complications, we've got to put something in place. Now that's not really the conversations we're having anymore. It's sort of the realization of you need this and boards or C-suites or just high profile leaders in some of our organizations that we work with are, are the ones driving this. It's not somebody internal telling them we need to have this. It's sort of top down, I think is a big switch too. You guys mentioned great points about remote work and I think it's given us a space to inform clients on new exercise topics. Instead of saying, if we did this to your building, now we have the opportunity to pose, if we do this to where your workers live. So if this area is hit by some type of natural disaster, or if this area loses internet connection, now we get to give them new ideas on how to deal with these disruptions that aren't just impacting one building. We have more of a blank space that we can work with of, okay, we only impact this area of workers. How is this area that's not impacted going to compensate? Rather than you take out a building, you take out everyone in that building. Work from home, there's sometimes where it's uneven. It's not the same as a whole building losing power. It's one team lost power. And now you're trying to figure that out from different parts or different states. Yeah. The so it's similar to how the industry has changed. How have we changed? Now, mind you, eight years ago, uh, when the podcast started, I think at that point, Bright Path was two and a half years into existence. I think I was still the only employee. We would hire two folks in early 2017, uh, one of which is still here. Um, but other than the obviously, the company has grown, there's a lot more of us than there were eight years ago, but what else has changed about Bright Path? I certainly have thoughts. Um, being next longest tenure on here, um, but I'm curious, kind of Haley, Jamie, you know, just from what you've experienced even in the last year to kind of what we've talked about as a group, how we used to do things, like what stood out. I think we've started changing the way that we work internally. So as we have fluctuations in whether we get a new client or we end a project, we've kind of learned how to work in a way that is best, not only for us, but best for our clients. So we're constantly talking about what could make this easier for the client? What could make this process better? If we're repeating a process, how can we make ourselves more automated or while still having autonomy on how to make that individualized to the client. But we're constantly looking at how do we make ourselves better as a Bright Path team? But number one, what does it look like for our client to be better? I feel like we evolve a lot. Almost with every client, we have talks about what to do different. I think that automation piece, kind of you mentioned, is is key. You, you sort of explain the nuance there, you know, that it's not so much that we're thinking about how to make things cookie cutter it's sort of figuring out ways to your original point how do we do things in a way that best serves our clients so we're sort of structuring and automating the way that we're initially engaging with folks so our kickoff process our onboarding process all of that we've sort of honed in on a on a rhythm that we and tools and materials that we use to have those discussions that enables us to have deeper, more thoughtful conversations around what it is that they need and how we're designing something for them and sort of less on, you know, how are we just turning over things and, you know, being a machine? It's really 
where those moments that we can become more customized to what it is that they need and having a deeper integration with the way that they operate and the way that they think and really getting to that cultural piece that we find really important, you know, to touch on as we're working through this to really make their culture different when it comes to this, this work. What, um, what other trends have we seen with resilience? I think specifically, like, are there certain industries that we've come across where we think there are clear, like industry opportunities to think about things differently, to be more prepared, to be more resilient in what we see out there where maybe different approaches are called for? I think approaches based on interest, based on industry more so than anything else, I think feels, feels like one of the more important focus areas that we've thought about, or we've seen evolve that we've adapted into, or tried to take a leading kind of thought angle against, because I do think there are pieces, especially post COVID, you know, and I don't want to keep beating on COVID, but post COVID, a lot of organizations sort of reevaluated themselves and there's some higher dependencies on different things. Some are more dependent on technology. Some are still very dependent on manufacturing and plants and facilities while others don't have that and they can be fully remote for the most part. Um, and I think that that piece from an industry standpoint really stands out. I think healthcare is certainly one, um, I think, you know, sort of that manufacturing, but also nonprofits are another one too, in terms of how they're operating and how they're doing their, their work, um, which oftentimes is highly face-to-face -face kind of physical transactions between people having conversations, seeing what the results of their work are in those meaningful ways and how that's changed. But I do think there are some, are some spaces, you know, but I think just that that industry piece has really, really kind of shifted, I think, in a way that we didn't necessarily anticipate. I like that Bray brought up healthcare because I think they have a constant target on their back that's never going to change. They're always going to have sensitive data that somebody could access. So that industry is going to continuously have to evolve to new cybersecurity threats. How do they mitigate that? How do they handle those? As technology changes, they're going to have to change with that to protect that sensitive data, knowing that someone's always going to be after it. I think, too, with the, the regulatory requirements that the healthcare industry and also like finance and banking industries um, have to meet, they, they have to put a lot more thought into their continuity and resilience strategies so that they are staying compliant. And then I think another area too, like with the energy and the utilities, um, those critical infrastructure pieces are becoming really important too when we think about potential for um, cyber attack and just, you know, maintaining operations. Yeah, I mean, the amount of, the amount of targeting of public infrastructure, private infrastructure, things that we're all using on a day in and day out basis has really, really jumped and I would say jumped more so from a perceptual standpoint, less so than, you know, it being a hot target. It's always been a hot target, but I think perceptually and publicly those spaces to your point, Jamie, are just, they're, they're really starting to bubble to the forefront in ways that, you know, they weren't before because it was too doomsday scenario. <laughs> now it's, it's much more like real, like the water shut off um, or the electricity does not work. Um, the other thing I, I think about too here is, and for everybody that's probably heard me talk before on this, and certainly this group has the reliance on the way that organizations are thinking about structuring themselves from a continuity and probably more so in the crisis management space or emergency management space where they're, I think they're starting to realize that some of the models that have been out there and 
and in existence for a long time with namely sort of the, the incident command structure and some of the things that, you know, the U S kind of federal government has put out against this space in order to one, prepare critical infrastructure and prepare themselves as government bodies at, you know, federal, state, local, municipal levels don't translate well to other types of organizations. And so I think a lot of organizations are starting to realize like, ooh, this doesn't fit or this is really cumbersome or why do we have a, a hundred page plan for something that, you know, we never, we never really look at. We just sort of make up on our own. And that seems to be a lot of the conversations we're having in the last couple of years, especially around how do we, how do we think about this differently? How do we change this? How do we structure ourselves differently? And I think that realization of, yes, those models have a lot of good fundamental things in them, but they're really designed for a specific audience and they're not supposed to be, they're not created to be applied wholesale against any organization. And I think that that piece has sort of started to evolve the thought process and the conversation as there's probably been a little bit of a changing of the guard too, from an expertise standpoint and um, you know, new blood, fresh blood, different takes, those sorts of things that has just started to change the conversation there. When it feels like, I mean, we, we've talked about this before and you brought up, a, you all have brought up a couple of the industries that came to mind, but there's definitely been some areas where I feel like companies have just overcomplicated this. Yeah. Um, I think I recently, uh, made a, 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 you know, one of the short Instagram reels that we do where I talked about how we came across a, I can't remember, it was 56 pages, 64 pages, a policy. Yeah. And I was like, what are you, why is, are you doing this? And the, the answer from the team, when we, the company, when we asked them about it, it was like, well, people wouldn't follow the plan. So we put all of it in policy because then they have to acknowledge it and it's there for them to see it. I'm like, this is not the way. Like if you watch the Mandalorian, this is not the yeah, way. That is not the way. <laughs> that is not going to to get you where you need to go. It's, it's frustrating. Um, one of the questions that we were asked, we did solicit questions for this. One of the questions we were asked is, "What's been the most challenging crisis?" or incident that you've worked on and how did we navigate it, whether it was for us or for our client? I don't know if anyone has any examples. Oh. <laughs> We're all like, uh, yeah, let me think about the mental list. <laughs> right. Where, no, where to begin? Um, you know, I think nothing, it, and I say this a little bit tongue in cheek, nothing sort of stands out as sort of most challenging. I think the ones that I've certainly been a part of in, you know, previous career moments, or even now with clients, I think that the most challenging aspects of these is tends to be on the communication front and the desire. And I say that sort of in two parts. One is, figuring out who is responsible for doing what pieces of the communication, because there's oftentimes sort of a jumbling of the operational communications that your response team or your crisis management team is doing and communicating and sending to leadership and within the organization to build that situational awareness and common understanding of what's happening. But then there's also the outputs that come out of a response in terms of how are we messaging or placing holding statements or delivering different direction or communications to the different stakeholder audiences that are impacted by the situation. Mm -hmm. Those processes tend to be the most clunky and the most jumbled for lack of a better word in terms of figuring out who's responsible for drafting and writing, who's responsible for re reviewing, what's the time frame for doing so, how are we distributing those things? And so when those things aren't laid out clearly, and when there's a D, when you're de-emphasizing some of those pieces within there, and you're rushing to say, oh, we got to get a holding statement, or, you know, we don't need a holding statement, you know, even the inverse, 
just not having that thought process and really working that out tends to have complications. And I think where that then bleeds into is having responses that are not right sized necessarily for the situation, or there's mm -hmm. a lack of seriousness applied to some things. So some organizations are looking at this from an awareness standpoint, and there's pieces that they're just not hearing about from an impact standpoint that makes a difference. So if you don't know that your customer service center is being bombarded with information because you never asked them that question or nobody talked to them and they're on an island trying to do what they need to do and they're not sure if the rest of the organization knows that can have a really adverse impact to the way that you want to approach things going forward too because they're just they're giving the wrong information they're complicating the situation or there's other areas that aren't aware or are aware and just saying, well, that's not that big of a deal because they're not, there's not a full situational understanding of what's going on. And mm -hmm. I think that's where, that's where organizations tend to get into the, the biggest, the biggest opportunity for failure, for lack of a better word, or at least for multiple complications to what's happening. I think along with communications, like you mentioned, um, decision making, I've seen a lot of hangups with decision making and the whole decision making process. Um, who's going to be making that decision? Is it the crisis response team? Is it the executive team? What decisions are they making or not making at each level? Um, instances where the decision maker is on vacation and not available to make the decision. Um, and not knowing what to do in that situation. And so I think um, that can really slow down and hamper a, a response effort. Um, so working through that as part of the, the exercises that we do to make sure that they are talking through that decision-making process and keeping things moving along. The challenges, for, I, there's two that always come to mind when I think about like the most challenging crisis I've ever been in. One is, uh, and we've done a whole episode on this in the past, but uh, we had an active shooter scare at a corporate headquarters building when I was running crisis management for a Fortune 30 company where I, for a number of hours, I think we thought we had employees that had been killed and it turned out to be a false alarm. Uh, it was uh, construction noise that sounded like rapid fire gunshots so I think we were lucky. There was a lot of lessons learned out of that, but it, that just, that was a emotionally difficult ringer of a day <laughs> to get through. And then there was a lot of uh, second guessing uh, in the days and weeks to come. Some of which came from a, a place of not being educated on processes. Um, the other one, it was COVID um, because there was so much uncertainty uh, we didn't know if there was a way out. We didn't know uh, if there would be a vaccine. We didn't know how to treat the dang thing. We didn't know what was going to happen. Uh, and there was so much misinformation uh, floating around out there that hampered the response. Um, and I, it went on for so long, months, years. Um, a lot of companies weren't being well led by their resilience function. Uh, we've talked about that before. And I think for folks that work in this space, um, it caused a lot of long-term stress um, because a lot was riding on our ability to guide and make decisions uh, as leaders in this space. And I think a lot of folks really struggled with how long this went on and what that meant for their own mental health uh, as we worked through it. So those two are the ones like, one is very acute, like it was over in five hours. Uh, and then we just had the aftermath to deal with. And the other one, you know, we're still dealing with elements of this four years later. I think the only thing that kept me sane during COVID uh, was being able to talk with all of you. Not all of you were here then, but those of you that were. 
um, because I knew I was in an island of rationality. And the, uh, you know, I had gone to um, uh, the National Preparedness Leadership Program at Harvard, and we had calls every other week during the peak of the pandemic. And that was my one other island of sanity, like where we could let our hair down and just talk about what we were all experiencing and how to work through it and how we could support each other. That was a pretty trying time. So letting your hair down as opposed to lighting it on fire. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, in every other I, conversation we were having, I I can't remember who said that. Uh, um, one of uh, I do remember who said that. I can't say who it was, but um, a senior, a very very senior non commissioned officer in one of our military branches, um, who I did not know prior to these alumni calls, who uh, talked about this is like this is the one place I can go and their sanity. <laughs> so. <laughs> that was uh that was even scarier considering the yep. role that he had <laughs> it's not the vote of confidence you want to hear it's not the vote of confidence he was in a different position then now he is uh he's in his terminal position i think um he's had a good 35 year career but anyway um let's see off of our list of questions what are i think we've had we actually we've answered that one what about technology has evolved that's changed our approach to crisis management business continuity and crisis communications what's different today than eight years ago i can talk from just an internal point on how we use technology to manage i think we have a lot more tools to help clients than ever new things come out and we find new ways to help mm -hmm. but i know that you and brain jamie would have more on the client side well i think you, to kind of piggyback or help or kind of bridge that point i think from our standpoint sort of when you asked that question my initial reaction was i don't know not much mostly because we were sort of in in this new way of operating before COVID even hit, um, we were all largely a remote workforce, um, some closer than others to sort of home office, you call it that. But I think this way of engaging and collaborating wasn't so much of a stretch for us. And I think that has helped to Haley, your point in terms of applying how we go about this and how we think about this and how we've challenged ourselves and organized ourselves into translating that to clients and other organizations, as well as looking at different technology pieces to continuously sort of improve the way that we do things, as well as finding opportunities where that technology would help clients move through something. I mean, we have clients that are still using you know, Word files and Excel spreadsheets to do some of this stuff because that's where they're at. But most of our clients have begun translate or sort of transitioning to different business continuity tools, different applications that help them kind of manage and support their resiliency capabilities internally that, you know, isn't just on a on a word doc anymore it, and it's really amplified the way that they're able to engage and solve problems and understand information they're able to build better exercises they're able to do faster responses in the moment they're able to answer business questions that they haven't been able to before or that some of our other clients who aren't using those tools for whatever reason they just don't have that ability to quickly answer some of those questions that some of this technology has afforded us and other clients. I mean, I think collaboration tools have made it easier to do things than we had before. I mean, uh, I remember 15 years ago, we were looking for a persistent chat tool and they didn't exist. Um, right like now we have microsoft teams we have slack there are there's matter most there are other similar competitors in that space those tools just really weren't there 
at the time. I think we, we had instant messaging, but nobody used it 15 years ago, like we do today. Um, there's, uh, I think, Zoom, WebEx, Teams, you know, online meeting capability have made collaboration and exercises, even in even for exercises or for crisis management, easier um, in ways that we couldn't do before. Um, I mean, before COVID, I don't think we ever tried to lead an exercise uh, remotely, virtually. Um, but now we do that. That is our preferred method, right? We'd rather do that mm -hmm. than do an exercise in person. Um, I think we do have one in-person exercise contracted for this year so far, but everything else is virtual. Um, and I'm sure that even that exercise will have virtual participants. Oh, yeah. It's just interesting how those have, have changed uh, over time. When I'm... So I'm going to shift gears and talk a little bit about like professional development, skill set kind of stuff. But what what skills do we think are essential for people today to have? If they um, want to come into this space or if they want to succeed and grow in this space, what are the skills that they need to have? I think a fun part of our space is the creativity that comes along with it. Creating these exercise ideas you know, thinking outside the box of all the different situations that could happen that you need to prepare for, it gives you a lot more space to be creative than I think most people realize. It's almost an art and you get to have a lot more fun with it than in some other more cookie cutter type things. Ours is very changing and evolving and seeing Bray's brain work when he comes up with a scenario for an exercise is always cool because he comes up with this like elaborate thing and you're like, wow, that came from, you know, just a person thinking of this thing for a whole company or an organization. The creativity part, I think, is a great trait to have if you want to come into this space. I like that. I mean, from for me to kind of piggyback on that, I think it's that imagination angle of that creativity. So there's, you know, creativity is a huge part of that and having that imagination and avoiding the failure of imagination that we've seen over and over again in different kind of not so good outcomes or situations that failure to be imaginative or that failure to sort of think through something in a different way and be open to that i think is is really really important especially for us as resiliency professionals to be able to be in that space, even if our clients or peers or other organizations, other stakeholders aren't having that, I think is it's invaluable to be able to be creative in that, in that way. I think I would add interpersonal skills. Um, Hoping somebody would bring this up. Yeah, we just work with so many different teams, um, you know, partnering with teams across the organization, partnering with job titles up and down, um, and being able to work with those diverse teams and building consensus among different departments, getting buy-in um, from our participants so that they're engaged in the process and contributing and showing up. Um, it, yeah, I just think those interpersonal relationship building skills are really important and go a long way in building a successful program. I think the, the other piece too that sort of comes to mind as I'm been thinking about this is that ability to be open to constantly learning, constantly evolving, constantly maturing your skills, your knowledge, your your depth of understanding in this space and with industries and organizations and that curiosity that comes with it, but then being able to simplify that and make sure that that overcomplicated thought process or complicated procedure or the way that something is structured isn't necessarily right for that particular organization or write in the way that it's sort of designed in a grandiose fashion, that it really, you're able to boil it back to some simple fundamentals and then be able to build upon that. And I think that's when we have conversations with different folks, you know, in this field, 
there's really a heavy reliance on sort of the procedures and the process and you know the all the complicated mechanisms that can come with this space and not being able to sort of take a step back and go this isn't as complicated as it as it appears to be there are certainly challenging and kind of critical thinking that needs to happen in order to translate some different things or work through solutions but at the end of the day a lot of what we're doing here is not hard it's not overly complex it's not you know this mountain that you have to climb it really is simple when you boil it down to the to the basics and i think having that ability to keep learning and absorbing all that stuff but then being able to translate out that into a simple sort of creative fashion haley jamie to both of your points i think is that's essential to be able to translate that and present it in a way that folks who aren't in the space day in and day out can understand and appreciate and be aligned with in a way that they weren't before. Yeah, I think Jamie brought up one that I, I want to emphasize. I think um, interpersonal skills are essential in the resilience space of 2024. I think that a lot of previous resilience leaders were very comfortable driving this as a compliance exercise and mm -hmm. being comfortable looking at a screen and spreadsheets and data and sitting in a cubicle. And that is not what leaders need uh, in a future resilience program. That's not where CEOs and boards are looking for. Um, and I'm always fascinated that we have leaders who th think that way and then complain that they don't get the visibility or exposure or influence they want in the organization. You have to be able to go out and, and influence your stakeholders. You have to be comfortable interacting at that level um, because the things that you're planning for, the things you're dealing with, they're at the top of boards and executives' minds right now. Geopolitical unrest, um, uh, elections. More than half of the world will elect a new national leader or re-elect a national leader this year. That's That's crazy. Um, and it, it could lead to significant turmoil. No wonder companies are concerned about it. But those are the kind of things that I think, uh, those kind of skills I think are are elements that people need to, to be thinking about. And today they don't. My thought, anyway. Um, what, uh, let's see, we asked about skills. What are some emerging risks and threats that we think companies should be preparing for over the next few years? And I'll, I'll start cause I already brought it up the election, the political environment right now. Um, I personally have never been more concerned about election related unrest and violence in this country as I have been right now. Uh, I have a lot of concern about how November, December, and January will play out in terms of the U.S. political system and how this election goes, regardless of the results and what that means between now and inauguration in January. And as I pointed out, more than half of the world's population will have elections this year, which is cool for democracy. Uh, probably not great in terms of unrest because we just don't know. Uh, we're recording this. Uh, it's June 3rd, right? This is going to come out on June 10th. Mexico yesterday elected their first female president. I don't really know anything about mm -hmm. policies, Mexico not being my area of expertise. But that's a seismic change in Mexican politics. Mexican just culture as well. It's yeah. a very male-orientated country. And to have that changes, it's, it's going to be substantial. I think you're right in terms of the ripple effects that the political season, whatever that is um, anymore, will have throughout the course in the run up to the election, but then post election and then, you know, in the, in the year following for sure from a global scale in the changes that countries may be making the way that the U.S will approach things 
depending on the outcome, you know, there's economic consequences, there's inter global um, policy that will shift. There are a lot of challenges on, as well that are in play currently that may or may not get better or worse depending on the outcome of some of these elections that play out. And there's a lot of, there's a lot more than just kind of who's going to hold an office at stake anymore, especially this, this coming election season. Um, I think the other piece that, you know, sort of emerging risks and threats that I'm, I'm sort of thinking about as well as AI is certainly one, um, in terms of how organizations, companies, individuals are going to be using AI and the disruptive piece of that now could be risky, could be threatening, but I think it's definitely going to be more disruptive to the way that things are approached over the next couple of years. Um, excuse me. I also think just the way that natural occurring phenomenons are playing out. So thinking volcanic activity, earthquake activity, climate change, environmental policies, wildfires, water, all this stuff is definitely top of mind. And we're seeing some of the impacts from different things. We're seeing landslides that are, you know, wiping out towns. We're seeing different things that, you know, have happened since the dawn of time. You know, earth is an ever evolving place, but I do think that some of those things, the way that we kind of on this planet are starting to kind of group together a little bit tighter means a lot of those impacts are having more and more consequences, um, not necessarily for the better when these things happen. You know, Turkey was a good example here in the last couple of years where where that occurred really was more damaging than had it happened there, you know, 20 years before that, just based on the way that the population density is shifted. So I think some of those things are starting to come into play as organizations are thinking about things. I think, you know, water scarcity has always kind of been on people's radar from an, you know, enterprise risk management, you know, risk register standpoint for the last 15, 20 years. But I think now that's sort of, it, it's more and more real as people are starting to see. And so I think organizations are starting to really begin to focus and adapt to some of these things that are happening. I think I would also add cybersecurity threats, which have been and will continue to be a significant threat. Um, you know, the ransomware attacks and phishing, social engineering, supply chain cyber attacks. And a lot of our exercises recently with our clients have focused on some kind of cyber ransomware type scenario. Um, and also just our technology dependence overall, um, mm -hmm. whether that's on critical infrastructure and aging or vulnerable networks um, or technologies, um, leaving us open to, you know, potentially some cyber activity. Yeah, that's a good call. Um. Let's see, risk threats, what else looks interesting? What qualities do we think are the most important for leaders to exhibit during a crisis? Like we need to have like a chalkboard that says how many times we say make yourself important <laughs> <laughs> and hang it in the office. <laughs> But it's a reoccurring theme that we talk about at Bright Path is that leaders in business continuity, crisis management, disaster recovery, you need to make yourself important. And during a crisis to sit back and hold your opinion when you know how to potentially help solve an issue because you don't want to stir the pot or be too direct in telling people what to do is not going to help anything get solved. Make yourself important, make your case and try your best to assert yourself to your expertise. And the worst thing that happens is maybe it doesn't go the exact way you thought it was going to, but the best thing that happens is you just helped your organization 
be more resilient or implement a plan that I'm sure you spent so much time working on. Why not make your organization utilize that? Especially if they invest in someone like us, they have a company come in and write that. You spent the money on it, use it. You know, we helped you guys put something out there, make yourself important and make your case. Mm -hmm. I'll just emphasize that. I, I, I know I say that a lot. My good friend, Josh Harden, who died uh, from cancer uh, over a decade ago, uh, would say that all the time to people um, who worked in corporate security or retail loss prevention as we did, um, that um, you have to make yourself important and your failure to do so is your fault. Um, you can't blame that on anyone else. Uh, and I, I think that security professionals writ large and resilience professionals as well, just don't do a very good job of this. Um, no one's going to take you seriously. Or what was the line from Mad Men? Uh, no one's going to take you seriously because you don't take yourself seriously. Yeah. So I, I couldn't agree more, Haley. I think from an in the crisis standpoint, so you're in the moment, the boom has happened, you're in the moment. I think there's a couple couple key qualities that you know leaders need to think about there. One is making sure that there's decisiveness and decision making. So make sure you're you're leaving space for conversation, for debate, for critical thinking or brainstorming. But at some point, you gotta make a call and you gotta make a call on a timeline that's actually going to make a difference to the way that you're able to respond, whether that's mitigating a ripple impact and complicating your response. So now you have a reputational component to this thing that you didn't have before, or because there's a matter of urgency against safety and security of people, assets, the way that operations can continue. You have to drive towards something that's decisive in that decision making. I think the other piece is working the process and leaning into that from a kind of self-confidence standpoint or a presentation of confidence and letting out that perception of being calm and thoughtful, but decisive and direct. It's a really hard balance to strike when there's a lot of different emotions happening at the same time. It's high stress, but being able to kind of remove yourself from kind of the situation and take more of that air traffic control point of view on something and really lead and facilitate the process that, you know, Haley, to your point that you've put into place, relying on that to help guide you through that and setting a good cadence of when you're going to connect and respond and, you know, regroup is really, really important. And that also bleeds into that ability to you know, do some of the other things that we've talked about, whether that's, you know, as NPLI at Harvard would say, you know, leading multi-direction, you know, so leading up, down, across, being able to have that that skill set to do those things, but also keeping yourself in a in a space where you're effective and you're driving a process and you're facilitating that conversation. When everybody else is feeling uncertain or a little bit chaotic, you're able to just kind of keep moving the ball forward kind of holding holding the ground that you've taken in that response and positioning yourself into into that eventual position of we've sort of resolved this we can start thinking about recovery i think as a part of that it's really important to build those relationships in advance and um yeah you know foster them so you know who you're going to be reaching out to when you reach out to you know, Joe on the IT team, he's not going to be, who are you and what do you want? Um, you know, you have a well-established relationship and um, you can reach out and, and get that quick response that you might need. And then as a, a group, whether that's your crisis response team or or your, um, your recovery team, um, when you're working through exercises and scenarios and building that, that camaraderie amongst the group and that that working uh, relationship with each other to work out those kinks and know who, like you said, those decision makers are, who is responsible for what portion of whether it's communication or 
um, action items that need to be taken. Um, even things like we've had, you know, who's taking notes, um, things that you can just kind of iron out ahead of time so that the process is smooth when you're going into those complicated scenarios. Yeah, it's a good add on to that make yourself important piece. You know, it's not necessarily to the leaders above you. It's make yourself important to your partners and yeah. those people that you're going to rely on and depend on so that when you come calling or you activate, they're like, yep, got it. Let's go. And they're they're already invested before the thing has already happened. They, there's that pre-investment. They're just ready to go. Yep. Last question. What advice would you give to new professionals entering this field? Haley, be careful how you yeah, answer Everyone's like, everyone looks at Haley. Haley, <laughs> what would your advice be a year in, 15 months in? I think it's learning the expectations to have of yourself because the business is always going to change. Your clients are going to continuously change. What you're dealing with is always going to change. So the one thing that you can keep consistent is yourself. So are you still always learning more? Are you making an effort to be a better business partner and a better, you know, thought partner? I think I would have liked to know think more about just the expectations to have for me rather than trying to pin it on what to expect out of business continuity because you're never going to know what you're going to expect out of these disruptions so more know more about yourself you're never going to know everything about every disruption or disaster that could happen so know about yourself what kind of employee do you want to be what kind of leader do you want to be and I think had I thought about that more a year ago I would have started off a bit stronger and came in making myself more important to these teams Whereas now I'm happy to tell someone what to do with their business continuity plan. So <laughs> knowing more about yourself, try to learn more about what type of leader you want to be in the field rather than trying to learn everything about the field. Yeah. Well, I think that's good. Hey, don't be afraid to dabble in all the areas because I think yeah. we can get really pigeonholed. Like I do business continuity planning and I help them do their updates and um, Bray does exercises, but you know, taking time to dabble in each other's subject matter expertise. And it really helps to create, like I mentioned before, that more holistic enterprise resilience picture um, when you know a little bit about all the pieces. Yeah, your aperture is wider as you're viewing something rather than just through a business continuity lens, you have much broader view of what, what the consequences or impacts of that would be. Mm -hmm. I think for me, you know, the two pieces in this actually, um, not to selfishly plug, but it goes back to a couple of our values that we have. And, you know, one is being humbly confident in your expertise. So whether you went to school or you're bringing a set of expertise from, you know, a, a completely different professional experience, be humbly confident in what it is that you're talking about. Admit what you don't know or where you need to go sort of learn, you know, whether that's out loud or you share yourself, having that, again, that curiosity about your, about this field and the space and what's going on, because it's much broader than how does a, how is a business continuity plan structured? Or, you know, how do you make a crisis checklist or, you know, build an exercise? You have to know about what the scenario is in that exercise. How do the pieces work together? What's the machinery behind some of that in order to make a really good exercise or to understand why does this business continuity plan need to be structured in this way or why are we talking about this critical business activity in the way that we are and spending so much time structuring our plan around it because it has these sorts of impacts so being able to sort of open up your your vision and your and your world to a much broader range i think is really really important as you're trying to distill some of this stuff down into the really kind of simple things that get put into place at the end of the day. I think the other the other piece is, and I will say for both of these, hanging on to both of these qualities as you mature and evolve as a professional in the space are just as important as 
developing them in the first place because without these two things and i'll get to the second one here in a second you really run the risk of one not making yourself important as we've talked about but two not being effective and not being able to make the most out of what it is that you're trying to do as a professional in this space and so the second thing would be um you know so humbly confident but then also being empathetically direct so a lot of times when we get into some of our conversations with clients or organizations are really frustrated that the org you know as we've kind of talked about isn't doing what we want them to do or they're not understanding or they're they're doing all sorts of you know crazy things or they're not listening but being that empathetically direct so being understanding what it is that they are challenged with or what is challenging them in not achieving that but then being direct about you have to change this or if you do this they're not going to get it or this won't be as effective unless you're doing these pieces and having that mindset about you really helps to develop those relationships but it also just helps kind of keep yourself um in a really healthy spot too that you're not being overly aggressive or overly frustrated or anything like that it really comes down to i am trying to help you sometimes i just have to tell you the truth so it's sort of being somebody's best friend in a situation where you know you may not have been their best friend before but really having those honest conversations around things and doing it for the betterment of the organization and the, the process or the team or whatever it is mm -hmm. makes a huge difference so i think those those two values that we kind of espouse i think are really really strong skills that new professionals need to really think about and develop one thing that i wish i i don't think i grasped it when i came into this but when i uh, was approached about leading the team at our previous employer i was doing other things uh, and um i was asked about would you be willing to take on this team where we're going to combine crisis management and business continuity uh, and I'm like, well, I don't know anything about business continuity. And they literally were like, yes, but you do know how to market what you're doing. And that's what we need. We need someone who can go out and market the thing. Um, you can learn the BC stuff. And I'm like, you're out of your damn mind. But <laughs> it was true. It just took me a while to really realize how important it was going to be to go out and advocate be an advocate for the team and help them obtain the resources that they needed and advocate for their work. And that's, you know, I think it goes back to what Haley brought up before in terms of making yourself important. Um, we have to button things up there because we've run out of time here for that we allotted to do this, but that's it for this 250th episode of the Managing Uncertainty podcast. Thanks for joining us. We appreciate your support and listening over the years uh, and we'll be back next week with our 251st episode thanks for joining thanks for watching our video to learn more about how to manage uncertainty and disruption in your organization be sure to like follow and subscribe to our video channel and here are a few more videos that we've selected that will help you learn more about business continuity crisis management and crisis communications